dreams while you're feeling blue. Dreams, that's the thing to do. Dreams while there's smoke rings floating in air. You find your share of memories there. So dream. Uh, this this is Judd Hart speaking. Uh, uh, from all records that we have, uh, it shows that I was born uh, about 40 minutes into the morning of February 15th, 1915, which was a little disappointment to my mother because uh, she had wanted to have a heart baby on Valentine's Day, and I missed it by just a little bit. Judd Oman's Hart was the third son, the sixth and final child, of Parker Madison and Amanda Julia Johnson Hart. He was born Monday, February 15, 1915, in the family home in the small town of Cedar Edge in Delta County, Colorado. As an incorporated town, Cedar Edge was then just eight years old. Until 1882, the area was inhabited by the Tavawachi Nuuchi people, better known as the Ute Indians. Located at an elevation of 6,200 feet on the southern slope of an expansive high mesa called Grand Mesa, Cedar Edge and the surrounding Surface Creek Valley was and remains a fruit and cattle producing area. Parker and Amanda's Bundle of Joy was accompanied in 1915 by World War I raging in Europe, including Germany's use of poison gas, Typhoid Mary infecting 25 at New York's Sloan Hospital for Women, the U.S. House of Representatives rejecting a proposal to give women the vote, Babe Ruth the Bambino hitting his first home run, Albert Einstein introducing his theory of general relativity and the patenting of the Raggedy Ann doll. Judd joined two brothers and three sisters. Laura Eileen, called Eileen, age 12. Leola May, called May, age 10. Parker Madison Jr., called Parker, or just Park, age 8. Harold Winfield, called Harold, age 5. And Doris Catherine, called Doris, age 3. But uh, my name, Judd Owens, heart came from my dad, who was a great one for uh, family names. And it seems that he had two grandmothers, or a grandmother and a great grandmother. Well, the grandmother was, uh, the maiden name was Judd. And the great grandmother, the maiden name was Owens. So he named me Judd Owen, so I was elected to, to take on those two old family names. And uh, of course I spent most of my boyhood uh, not liking uh, the names very well, and I wanted to be George. Now, uh, I don't know why I wanted to be George, because by the time I got to be a teenager, why I really liked the Judd, because whenever I heard the name Judd, I knew it was me, and not George somebody else. <laughs> Judd's childhood nickname was Juddy. Later, it was Juddo. He challenged friends to guess what the O in Juddo stood for, informing them that he would recite the correct O name if they would simply identify it. He would recite names such as O Henry, O Gosh, O Man, O Leary, O Yeah. Rarely would anyone pick O Man. He also responded to Judd Spud stuck in the mud. 
On his father's side of the family, Judd's roots can be traced to the first New Englanders who arrived in Massachusetts on the Mayflower. That side of the family gravitated persistently westward, seeking new land and opportunity, a family characteristic that Judd seemingly did not inherit, but one that was expressed strongly in Judd's father and that disrupted Judd's childhood. On his mother's side of the family, Judd's grandparents, Eric and Britta Johnson, came to the United States from Sweden, arriving in the late 1860s. Also pulled westward, the Johnsons were early pioneers in Colorado's Surface Creek Valley. In the latter part of the 1870s and early 1880s, in mountain towns such as Georgetown, Breckenridge, and Leadville, Eric supplied timber and horses for mining operations on the eastern flank of the Rocky Mountains. In 1876, a daughter, Emma, was born in Georgetown. In 1883, a second daughter, Judd's mother, Amanda, was born in Leadville. In 1878, after scouting ahead into Indian Territory, Eric applied to the U.S. government to purchase 160 acres of land in what was to become Gunnison County, land that was transected by a vibrant stream known as Surface Creek which could supply water for irrigating a ranch. That property now sits just north of the small town of Eckert, Colorado in Delta County. In 1882, the Utes were forcibly removed from the region, and by 1884, the Johnsons had moved to the land on Surface Creek. On the Johnson Ranch, Eric farmed and raised horses, which he supplied for the mining operations in the San Juan Mountains. With partner Albert Weir, he applied for and was granted approval to construct a dam on Grand Mesa to impound snowmelt water. In the spring, summer, and autumn, water from the Weir and Johnson Reservoir still flows for agricultural uses in the Surface Creek Valley. Tragedy struck twice within the young Johnson family and orphaned the children. Judd's grandmother, Britta, died in the spring of 1886, likely from postpartum complications of her son Walter's February birth. Then in 1891, while continuing to ranch and raise his three children, then aged 15, 8, and 4, Judd's grandfather Eric saddled his horse, took his dog, and rode about 10 miles to the bank where he intended to withdraw money from Sweden for him to buy more land and livestock but Eric did not return to the ranch. In the spring of 1892, workers cleaning brush out of Tongue Creek near the Gunnison River discovered the bodies of Eric, his horse, and his dog, apparent victims of an assault, armed robbery, and murder. No one was apprehended for the robbery and killings. Suspiciously, not long after Eric's body was discovered, a man named Richard Forrest, who had no former ties to the Johnson family, posted the necessary cash bond of $1,100 and petitioned the Delta County Court to appoint him as executor of the Johnson estate. Because there were no Johnson relatives other than the three minor children, the court took his cash, likely stolen from Eric, and appointed Forrest as executor and guardian of the children. Over the course of the next two years, Forrest methodically sold the ranch's livestock and used creative accounting to divert proceeds to his own use. Over the years, the same Richard Forrest was a person of interest regarding the disappearance of his business partner, William Alexander, a circumstance that financially benefited Forrest. Unlike Eric's body, Alexander's was never found. The Johnson Ranch House was within sight of the roadway that linked Cedar Edge and Delta. One day, about 1893, Greg Smith, a driver for the Lovett Transport Service, passed by and noticed a group of men ransacking the Johnson home. Smith's boss, Samuel Lovett, and his wife, Kate, had come to Cedar Edge from Taos, New Mexico, and Sam was rumored to have had an association with both Bill Cody and Kit Carson, and Sam knew how to handle a gun. Appalled at what Smith told him, Sam strapped on his pistol, 
and he and Smith rode to the Johnson house where they confronted the men and stopped the thefts. Sam also found three frightened children there. Young Emma, at age 17, with some help from the nearby Weir family, was trying to take care of Amanda and Walter. Walter was left in the custody of Emma, but Lovett brought Amanda, then age 9 or 10, to Cedar Edge to be cared for by him and Kate. In November 1893, Sam and Kate adopted Amanda, but she kept her Johnson surname. On April 9, 1894, Emma married James Frank Weir, and shortly afterward, they successfully petitioned the Delta County Court to remove Forrest and appoint them executor of the estate and Walter's guardian. By way of Michigan, Alabama, and Kansas, Judd's father, Parker Madison Hart, arrived in Cedar Edge in 1900, where he met, fell in love with, and in March 1902, married Amanda, then just 18. We lived in a, in a big house, one of the better houses in Cedar Edge at that time. My mother had uh, used uh, some of her inheritance mother money to uh, build this uh, big house. Initially, Parker and Amanda and their first four children lived on Amanda's one-third portion of the Johnson Ranch north of Eckert. But Parker did not fancy himself a rancher, and he convinced Amanda to sell her portion of the ranch. With the proceeds, they bought five acres of land on the western side of the town of Cedar Edge, Colorado. To the north and west of the home were a series of small ponds fed by nearby springs. Stables and barnyards set across the ponds to the west of the house. The family had two horses, several milk cows, chickens, a couple of hogs, and always a large vegetable garden. The original hard home, long since owned and occupied by others, suffered a fire in the 1960s and the house was demolished and replaced. At age five or six, Judd and his brothers were wading in one of the ponds. Judd stepped into a hole and completely submerged. He didn't yet know how to swim. Fortunately, his brother Parker saw his plight and saved him from drowning. Judd later became an excellent swimmer. The neighborhood was known as Kid's Corner because of its many families and children, and Judd made numerous friends whose friendship lasted his entire life. Kids would gather for games of stickball, kick the can, hide and seek, with plenty of rough housing. A small stream to the west known as Happy Hollow served as the fishing hole. In Surface Creek, a larger stream, an area known as Old Stumpy, served as a swimming hole. Judd's early years were punctuated by illness and by dislocation precipitated by his father's wanderlust. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1917 through 1919 struck hard in Cedar Edge. Judd escaped severe infection, but not so his siblings and relatives. His father, Parker, working as a butcher in the local Stewart Mercantile, now the Grand Mesa Arts and Events Center, caught it first and brought it home, infecting the entire family except Judd's sister, May. His sister, Doris, suffered the most, barely surviving her infection. The Lovitz, Judd's adoptive grandparents, died relatively young in that period, presumably infected by Spanish flu. I'm not going to go into all of the things that my dad did because it was kind of a mixed up affair through the years, but when I was eight years old, why, he had gone to California and had uh, gotten a job with the Edison Company in, in uh, Long Beach, California, and it was a real good job, and uh, he wrote to us that if we wanted to see him again, we had to come to California. In August 1923, Amanda sold all the household goods, rented the house, and loaded a westbound train with herself and five of the six children Eileen had married by that time. 
Judd's dad had set up a small house in Pomona, California, where the family lived for about two years in reasonable comfort while he worked for the electric company. Then, deciding once again that the grass might be greener on the other side of the fence, Parker quit the carpenter job and bought a small plot of land with a small peach orchard on the outskirts of Pomona. There, he built a two-room home, essentially a shack, for his wife and children. Uh, as usual, he, he took shortcuts and everything, and I know Parker and Harold and I, we, we slept in a, uh, a wagon box out uh, in the a little orchard. While in Pomona, Judd began earning money. He planned to attend college and deposited his earnings in a Pomona Savings and Loan Bank. Nearby was a dairy farm, and he made friends with the owners and their children, landing him a job on the dairy's delivery route. The 14-year-old son of the owner drove the milk delivery truck at night. Judd serviced the customers by depositing new filled milk bottles into the customer's porch and picking up the empties. For his efforts, he earned 50 cents a night. During the day, he hawked newspapers. He sold three different papers, the Los Angeles Herald, Los Angeles Express, and Los Angeles Record, for three cents apiece, and was able to keep one penny apiece for himself. Then, at age 12, Judd suffered a ruptured appendix. An emergency surgery was performed, which he survived, but he had a long recovery. And in the spring of 1928, Judd's father was once again lured over the horizon. In Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, the U.S. federal government was building large dams to sequester water for agriculture, recreation, and domestic water supplies. In conjunction, land was being made available for homesteading. The Hart family unit by this time had been reduced to Judd, his mom and dad, and sister Doris. Eileen and May were both married, Parker Jr. was working near San Diego, and Harold had hitchhiked back to Cedar Ridge so he could attend Cedar Ridge High School his junior and senior year and graduate with his friends there. The four remaining hearts sold what assets they had, loaded a Model T Ford with tents, food, and necessary supplies, and began driving north. During the summer months of 1928, they led a Grapes of Wrath life making their way slowly through Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Mostly they camped, sleeping in their tents, but at times they found accommodations with relatives living near their route. All the while, Judd's dad was on the lookout for the Eden he was lured toward. To make ends meet, they worked as migrant farm workers. And uh, we traveled all that summer up through that area. We we picked berries, we picked the cherries and all kinds of fruit through the summer there. We did all kinds of things like that, making ends meet. By the fall of 1928, Parker finally realized that the dams would not be completed for another five years and that the immediate availability of homesteading land was a delusion. He became resigned to ending his quiotic wanderings. Doris went to Pomona by train to live with her sister May and graduate with her high school friends in the 1930 class of Pomona High School. Parker Sr., Amanda, and Judd returned to Cedar Ridge, nearly penniless. In addition to his ramblings, Judd's father had also made speculative investments that had lost money. They had sold the home in West Cedar Ridge. Amanda was heartbroken when she discovered some of her prized belongings stored at the house had been pillaged. They arrived back in Cedar Edge almost exactly a year before the October 1929 stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. of you.